All right, what about the question of should a church have multiple elders as opposed to just one? Um, now, I'm not against multiple elders, and I think throughout the Bible we see that churches did have multiple elders, and if, our, if churches had multiple elders, I, I think that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, I just want to show you this verse in Numbers uh, 24. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them and they were of them that were written. And, and they were of them that were written, but, not, but went not out unto the tabernacle and they prophesied in the camp. So this was the appointment of the 70 elders that Moses did and he laid their hands on them and they were filled with the spirit. And, there, and look at this. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Edad and Mel, Ed, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Now, I don't know if I'm applying this verse totally correctly, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But when I was thinking of multiple elders, I thought about this verse where, you know, additional elders were there to help Moses with his, with his duties and with the leadership of the, the congregation of Israel. And we see here that, you know, Joshua, the son of Nun, sort of in his zeal for Moses' authority, says, you know, look, Moses, like, forbid these people from, from teaching in the camp. And then Moses makes this statement and says, you know, envious thou for my sake? You know, are you, are you trying to, you know, basically, are, are you worried about what it's going to do to me? He says, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And, you know, I have that same feeling when I think about multiple elders is, yeah, hey, that would be great. You know, would, would, you know, would the Lord that all the qualified men could, could, could be ordained and start churches and, and, and have that position. But you know what? I don't think that's the problem. You know, maybe in some circles the problem is, you know, there are qualified men and nobody wants to ordain them. But, you know, in my eyes, I think, hey, it would be great if there were more men that met those qualifications because the more elders, the better, right? So the question is not, you know, why not have multiple elders? Why do we only have one elder in this church? Well, it's because right now we only just have one. Um, I'm not against having multiple. I think it would be great if there are multiple. Um, but the question is more, are there even multiple men qualified to have multiple elders? Because it's great to say, hey, we want elders, we want more elders. Well, where are the men? You know, we need the men to meet the qualifications so that we can have those multiple elders. And let's say our church had multiple elders. You know, we're so small and, you know, is it, is it even a need? But, you know, let's say we had two elders in this church. Why would we keep those elders together when, you know, Australia is such a dry and thirsty land for good Bible-believing churches? I mean, we'd probably spread out, right? That's why one day we're going to uh, ordain Kevin. Kevin's working towards that goal. And we're planning on going out, sending him out to the Sunshine Coast to start a church there. Because what's the point of ordaining him and keeping him here when we already have an elder here, when there are people that uh, you know, don't have a church like this to go to. So if you had multiple, why not uh, spread them out? But number two, can you even support multiple elders? Because you know, what, what's the point of having multiple elders if you can't even pay these elders? Because you know, right now, you know, I'm working a full-time job as well because you know, our church isn't at the point where it could support me financially. So you know, do you even have the funds as, as a church to have multiple elders. So, you know, what's the point of having two, three, four, five elders um, when, when you can't even support them? They might say, well, you need to have multiple elders to, so that they're accountable to one another. But we already saw, you know, and I won't turn there since last week, but, you know, bishops and deacons, or well, bishops specifically, are accountable to God. They're not accountable to each other. Right? So one is not accountable to the other. So when you say, well, they're there for accountability, or okay, maybe finances, if you have that sort of structure where you've you know, got to vote on finances and all that stuff, and you don't want one person taking the finances from everyone else. But in terms of doctrinal independence, I mean, they're not accountable to one another because if one 
elder starts preaching a false gospel or whatever, I mean, he's accountable to God and the others can just separate. Because if they didn't agree to one, with one another, that they would just separate and start separate churches. So this whole idea of accountability um, doesn't really make sense. And one bishop should not have authority over another. We don't see that structure in the Bible. So I don't believe that there should be like a lead pastor or a head pastor and then the assistant pastors under him um, where you have this difference of hierarchy because once you are ordained a bishop you are on equal footing with every other bishop you don't see this hierarchy in the bible but you know what there doesn't really need to be a hard and fast rule because you know what you know man's ma man's nature is to set these hard and fast rules where god hasn't i mean you know it doesn't matter whether a church has one and you say well you can't have one you need to have multiple or you know somebody saying oh you should have one and you should have this structure or this hierarchy uh, you know what you know we i don't think we really need to make a hard and fast rule where god hasn't made a hard and fast rule we can allow you know liberty among god's people we can have liberty where people can exercise their preferences and opinions uh, and not go outside the clear teachings of the scripture you know I, one saying i always liked was when they say you know you can be outside of the box but make sure you're inside the book um, and you know, I'm more concerned when it comes to how other churches structure. You know what? I'm not so concerned about how they structure their authority or how they structure their leadership. You know what I'm more concerned about? I'm more concerned about whether they're preaching the truth. You know, like I'm more concerned that they're preaching salvation by faith, that you can't lose your salvation, that it's not repent of your sins. I'm more concerned that they're taking a stand for the King James Bible and revealing to people the fallacies of these false Bibles that are being uh, palmed off to people these days. So that's what I'm more worried about. I'm not so much worried about how they structure their authority. So they, they have a structure, they do votes. You know, I'm, I'm not for that. That's not my preference. And I don't think that's what the scripture, ex, scriptural example is. But that's not my main concern when I'm uh, looking at other churches. I'm more concerned that they're preaching heresy than um, how they're being structured. 